Well, I have to admit that's pretty amazing. Thank you, Katrina, and your family. Uh, I want to thank a few, uh, Susie Keeler for the piano, and Chris and uh, Ike Ketchum, and uh, Bryant for the deacon work. And serving me this morning, helping us, would be Ron Thompson on the inv invocation. Rick, uh, Terry will bring the message, and Ruth Terry will give the benediction, and I'm Roger Schulke. It's glad to uh, see each one of you, and I welcome you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and I pray that his spirit would be among each one of you. The uh, opening scripture comes from Doctrine and Covenant 17, chapter 4, verse A and B. <clears throat> By these things we will know there is a God in heaven who is infinite and eternal, for everlasting and everlasting, the same unchangeable God and the framer of heaven and earth and all things that are in them. And he created man male and female, after his own image and his own likeness created them, and gave unto them the commandments that they should love and serve the only living and true God, and they should be, that he should be the only being whom they worship. Thank you very much. We'll go on with the program. Hymn 334.
Lord and God. Our eternal Father, we are thankful to be in your house this morning. Thankful that we each have the opportunity, as we have just sung, to spread the gospel story. And we're here to understand how to live our lives better, to overcome sometimes a negative attitude, but to be ever mindful with the positive attitude of following you and realizing you brought us here to this place. You have chosen us. We haven't chosen you according to the scriptures, and we're so thankful you love us. You brought us here, and here we are at the opening of this service. I pray that your continual blessing will be upon our brother who is presiding, and upon our speaker, Brother Rick, as he brings a message of life to us and knowing how we should continue to be faithful in the cause of Christ, your, our Savior, you, Father. Thank you. And I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for these monies that we have gathered to stay, that you would use them for your purpose and that you would bless those that gave and those that desire to give, Lord. And let us always be mindful of the poor and the hungry and the unclothed. And, and we ask these things in the loving name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to read this morning from our new revelation, R-169, that was given to us uh, this past weekend. There is much around you that continues to draw my people's attention from the simplicity of the gospel and the love that I have asked you to have towards one another. Forgiveness and grace are needed everywhere as you continue to unite together in the worthy cause of the gospel.
Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you. Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses. the power of your love. So hold me close. Let your love surround me. Bring me here and draw me to
Katrina, what can I say? That was awesome. And your, your children earlier with you. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I could say amen right now, and my brother Bruce could come up and give the benediction, and we can all go home. That was great. Thank you. It's good to be back. You know, uh, Julie and I spent almost a year in hibernation, I guess you might say. Hopefully we didn't come out like bears, so. I have to say right off the bat this morning that uh, the Spirit kept leading me in different directions. It kept giving me different types of topics to start talking about. But after this past conference, I knew that I was on the right track. I started out several weeks ago talking about, uh, or putting together a talk about family. Your family, my family, the church family. And I used a little bit of what I had uh, put together at one of our online prayer meetings. Uh, several weeks ago, and it turned out awesome. It was a great prayer meeting, and the Spirit was with us, and I thought, okay, that's, that's what the Spirit wants me to do is talk about this. But then the next day, the Spirit came on me and said, you know, you need to share your testimony. You need to... Um, Talk about the things that you went through because there's somebody that needs to hear that. So I started preparing for that. And it wasn't but a day or two later that the Spirit came to me again and said, oh, by the way, the theme for today in his image, you need to talk about that. So I felt like I was kind of being pulled all different kinds of directions. But like I said, once I saw the theme, or the overall theme for the conference, which was walking in the way of God, and I heard the phenomenal sermons that went on, I thought, you know what, I can tie all of this together. And I think that that's what the Holy Spirit's trying to tell me, that I need to be able to put these together. So that's what I'm going to try and do this morning, is I'm going to try those, try those three topics together. Today's theme in his image is an invitation to me, to you, to us, to become more like the God that we worship. It's to empower us, indeed it, to command us to see his characteristics and to see his attributes and to see that they will come true in his people, his people, the God that made us, the God that we worship. Doctrine Covenants 22 was used very extensively throughout the conference, and one of my favorite verses is 23b in the Doctrine and Covenants. And I'm going to read that this morning. And there is no end to my works, neither to my words. For this is my work, and this is my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and the eternal life of man. His work and his glory. For us to live eternally with him. He wants us back with him. And that means that he wants us with him forever and ever. That's God's goal. That's his end game. And for us to be a part of God's eternal plan, we must become more like him. I thought that someone had read my notes because of what they were saying in the sermons this past week. Uh, paraphrasing what uh, President Patience on Sunday said, we must become more like God, and therefore we must become more like his 
attributes. And then he mentioned love and faith and, and patience, and he went on and mentioned several others. I'm reading a book right now, and of course the title is In His Image, but the, the author mentions specifically ten attributes of God. And I'm going to walk through a, a few of those this morning. I was initially, my original plan was to walk through all ten of them. And once I got into the first one, I understood that that's not going to happen. You could literally spend hours on each one of those ten. And uh, they're all extremely important. But I'm going to try and talk about one or two of them. You know, as we strive to go closer to God, we naturally, we naturally grow more like him. In his book, Leo Guthman, Living by the Promises of God, from which I'll be quoting several times today, says that this is the true purpose of mortality, that man can choose God to be his father, and in so choosing, learn to become like him. To me, that just kind of struck home so importantly that I want to read that one more time. The true purpose of you and I walking this earth is so that we can choose God to be our Father and in so choosing Him become more like Him. Leo also, Leo also points out that this is a process, a process that is never reached in a mere moment. It's going to take time. And what process is that? It begins with us becoming more like God. So what attributes did Terry, President Patience, and this author bring up? Being more holy, being more loving, being more goodly, more just, more merciful, more gracious, being more faithful, more patient, more truthful, and more wise. All things that we need to do to grow closer to God. You know, we frequently ask ourselves, or at least I say I should, I used to ask myself, God, what do you want me to do? However, I've come to the conclusion that God is also generally concerned about who I am as well as what I do. Those ten attributes give us a goal. They give us a target. They give us something to shoot for, if you will. You know, I heard the story of a woman who said that the, uh, she had two daughters, and they had both flown the coop, I guess you could say, and they were in college. And they both called her one week. And the first one said, Mom, my head is pounding, and I have to go to class. And I drank a glass of water. The second one called two days later and said, Mom, I'm feeling anxious about an exam that's coming up this week. Will you pray for me? And oh, by the way, I drank a glass of water. These stories might not make any sense to us until we know the story behind their comments. All their life, they had been brought up with any time that they had an ailment, the suggestion was made to try drinking a glass of water. You know, as we were growing up, as we raised our children, we may have heard some of the same things. Maybe not drink a glass of water, but have you brushed your teeth? Have you made your bed? Is your homework done? Is your room clean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Put, put in whatever phrase that was repeated to you over and over or that you repeated to your children. Our scriptures do such a great job of repetition for us. They keep repeating those things over and over to us. And if we will read and study and apply those words in our life, we will grow in our understanding of God. So if it's true 
that we uh, repeat what is most important, the one attribute and those 10 attributes that filters to the top is God's holiness. That's the one attribute that filters up. The, whole, the word holy in our scriptures is repeated 982 times. I counted every one of them. No, not really. I have a search window that I did that on. 982 times. Following this rule of repetition, the scriptures want our first thought about God to be that he is a holy God. All through scriptures, we read about the holiness of God. It's repeated over and over and over. I had a whole page of scriptures that I was going to start reading different scriptures from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants. They all talk about how we need to become more holy, but we just don't have time to do that. Just know that we are told that God is holy and we are to become more holy like him. President Patience, in his talk last Sunday, asked us a question. Are you doing what God wants us to do? If being more holy is one of God's greatest attributes, and it is, what are we doing to become more holy? To start with, and I probably should have done this right off the bat, let me define for you the word holiness. Holiness is a separation from the ordinary or the profane ways of the world on one hand, and on the other hand, it's drawing closer to our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to commit to making uh, holiness the primary purpose of our life. We need to have an extremely thirsty appetite for holiness. We need to stay attuned to the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit be our guide as we read and study in the scriptures. We need to study without distraction. One reason we need to do that is so we can let that Holy Spirit work in our life. I, I went on a priesthood visit one time where uh, the gentleman left his TV running all the time that we were there. I probably should have asked him to turn it off, but I didn't. And I just wanted to see if he'd leave it on, and he did, the whole priesthood visit. It wasn't very loud. It was in the background, but it was, it was annoying. And we just did not have that spirit there that we needed. Avoid moralism. Moralism is where you look and you act holy to impress others. Acting one way in church and then doing something completely different through the week is hypocritical to me. I have a neighbor who refuses to go to church because he says that there's nothing but a bunch of hypocrites in church. And the sad part of it is he's a good person. He would do anything for anybody. He's got a heart of gold. But all he sees in church is a bunch of hypocrites because of what he's seen when he went. Too bad. You know, people, and, and Josh in his sermon last uh, Sunday did a good job of it. People will see who you are and what you do. They'll see where you go on Sunday mornings. They'll see where you go on Wednesday evenings. I know uh, we've got a neighbor, and just this morning, uh, she was out in her yard, and we came out. I, had my, I didn't have my jacket on, but I had my tie on, my white shirt. Took Julie's walker out to the back of the car. And she looked up and waved at me, and she walks her dog every morning, and she knows where we're going. If people develop the idea that we're holy after watching you over a period of time, then so be it. Set yourself apart from the world. In Leviticus 20, 26, it says, And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. Does that mean that we have to stop being around other people and can't, can't go out and do anything? Absolutely not. We can separate ourselves, however, from the ways of the world. 
Where do you go? What do you watch on TV when you're watching TV? What sites are you going to on the internet for those of us that have internet? What are your fun things to do? Interesting. We need to practice self-control. You know, I used to say, Lord, give me patience and I want it right now. Well, I need to work on that one. We need to guard ourselves against not just the large sins or things that maybe we used to do, but the little things, little things that will creep into our lives. And they do that slowly until it's too late. They got you. You know, I was part of an organization one time where they said, you know, if you do anything for 30 days, it will become a habit. And that's good or bad. Anything that you do can be have, become a habit if you'll just do it for 30 days. So we need to be careful. Things like pride, envy, greed, hate, gluttony, lust. We can guard against all of those. We need to pray for holiness. Pray that the, that the Holy Spirit will intercede for us. And I'm sure that we could go on and on and on and list many, many different things that we could do to become more holy like our Heavenly Father. However, I'm going to shift gears here and talk about another of God's attributes, and that would be love. I would literally love to spend a couple hours talking about the word love and how it applies to God and us. Even then, that probably would just touch on the surface of it. Of all God's attributes, his love is perhaps the hardest one for us to conceive. Part of the issue of understanding God's love is linguistic. We're English-speaking people. Okay? The term love is used gen generally and indiscriminately. I love my wife. And I also love Whataburger. We in this country were mesmerized by, and most of us loved, the movie Titanic, which displayed a great tragedy, a huge loss of life. But it was all wrapped up in a theme around a love story. I was telling that to my daughter, and she says, well, I love it because of the historical nature of it. I'm thinking, yeah, right. But anyway, you know, on February 14th, we buy roses and boxes of candy, and we give it to our sweethearts. And we as guys, we better not forget that day. Since kindergarten, I think I can remember that far back. Since kindergarten, on February the 14th, or at least the holiday, we've been giving those little heart-shaped candy saying, I love you. Surely, surely there is a better way to describe love so that we know what we're talking about. And there, and there is. It's a language in which the Bible was written originally. The Old Testament, as most of you know, was written in Hebrews. And in Hebrew, there are ten different meanings for the word love. So when they say love, it's, there's ten different ways they can say it. Way too many for us to go over this morning. However, I wanted to talk about the New Testament. The Greek of Jesus' day is, is what the language of the New Testament distinguishes. Four different kinds of love, and they use a specific word for each. And actually there's five, but the one is only used once uh, in a lifetime, and, and uh, I'm not going to bring that up this morning. But the four are eros, and that's the word used to describe sensual or romantic love. It's the word that depicts that relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. Storge is the word used to describe a family love, the affectionate bond that develops between parents and children, brothers and sisters. Philia is the word used to describe the intimate love in the Bible that most Christians practice towards each other. 
or that brotherly love. And then there is agape. Agape is the word used to describe the love of God. This love is the highest of the four types of love. This term defines God's immeasurable, incomparable love for humankind. It is the divine love that comes from God. Agape love is perfect love, unconditional love, sacrificial love, pure love. President Patience told us Sunday morning that if we truly love God, we have to love others. I'm going to read from you uh, from John 13, if you have your scriptures with you. I hope you do. But if you have your scriptures with you, turn to John 13, 34 to 35. And I'm going to insert the appropriate Greek word for love in this scripture. A new commandment I give unto you. This is Jesus Christ talking. That you agape one another as I have agape you, that you also agape one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have agape love, or agape one to another. So, to become more like our fathers, we need to learn to have that agape love in our hearts towards others just like Christ has towards us. One more example I would like to examine, and that has to do with this attribute called love. And I'm sure you guys all know the story well. We're going to take it out of uh, chapter 21 of John. This is an interesting story. And there are a lot of uh, thought-provoking questions in this chapter. I'm just going to, because of time, I'm just going to go over, be able to highlight the first part of the story. So I'm just going to talk about a few things real briefly in the first part of it and then get right to where I want to go in the last part of the chapter. Just know, though, that there are a bunch of analogies in chapter 21 that could apply to me and it could apply to you. Even the writer, John, says that there were two unnamed disciples at this particular time in this story that we're talking about. I would suggest to you that one of those might be me, one of those might be you. Two unnamed disciples. Anyway. There'll be time another day to tell this story and, and, and the whole story of chapter 21 and how it could possibly relate to us. If you recall, the Lord had told his disciples to go to the mountain of Galilee and meet him there. Well, they went to Galilee, but they didn't go to the mountain. They went to the beach. And you know what? Peter... You got to love Peter. Peter's probably feeling pretty low about now. This is the third time that they that they're going to see Jesus. And he was painfully aware of his shortcomings. He had denied Christ 3 times. He had dropped the ball. He had told Christ these other guys may turn tail and run but not me, not the rock. I'll stand with you here no matter what. I'll die with you. But he dropped the ball and even cursed that he didn't know Christ. Peter, Peter is backsliding and he says, I'm going fishing. It's almost like I've had enough. I'm going fishing. Back to what he knew. Doing what the Lord had told him to leave. You know, I always tell our online class when we're talking that when we come across these stories, we need to picture ourselves in these stories. We need to do this so that we know how these people felt. 
to know why they might have done some of the things that they did. Those, those people in these stories are just like you, just like me. So this is how I want you to picture this this morning. It's early in the morning. It's, uh, the sun's not even up yet. It's light. I mean, it's, it's, before the sun comes up, it's light. It's kind of a grayish light. The sea. The sea is glass. There's not a ripple in the sea. There's a slight mist rising up off of it. There's a boat about a hundred yards off the shore. And Christ is on the shore. And he yells out to this boat, Children, do you have any meat? And the short, definitive answer is no, we don't. Jumping on ahead in the story, keep that picture in your mind because it's still early in the morning. Jumping ahead in the story, they're now all sitting at a campfire. Campfire going right there. The sun is just starting to peek its head over the horizon. The fish are frying, the bread's baking. The smells are awesome. Can you smell it? It's a beautiful, peaceful morning. Well, after they're finished with their meal, Jesus looks through the fire. My, my thoughts are that Jesus and Peter are probably sitting opposite of each other. And Jesus looks through that fire and directs his comments to Peter and says, Simon, which in Hebrew means shifting sand. Son of Jonas, which brings to me, to my mind, a, a guy that didn't do exactly what he was told about a thousand years earlier, who ended up in the belly of a fish. Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? What does these mean? These could mean several things. There's several illustrations there that they could mean. They could mean the disciples, the, the other people that are sitting around the fire. They could mean the 153 fish that are spread out along the shore that Jesus told Peter to go get. They could mean the boat that probably Peter owned, his old occupation where he felt very comfortable. That could mean a lot of things, but I think that they're probably talking about the disciples here. Whatever it was, Jesus said, do you love me more than these? The word love here is agape, that perfect love that we talked about earlier. And Peter answers in the affirmative, but he answers with the Greek word for love, philia, saying, yes, Lord, I do love you, and, but more like a brother. The Lord says, feed my sheep. Again, the Lord says to Peter, Simon, shifting sand, son of Jonas, do you agape me? Do you love me? And again, with maybe Peter getting a little bit frustrated now because this is the second time the Lord's asking, Lord, you know, you know me. I do fillet you. I do love you. Like a brother is the meaning there. And the Lord says, feed my sheep. The word there for feed, however, is different in the, in the Greek. In the Greek, it's tender, tender my sheep, or shepherd them, take care of them, be tender with them, show compassion and gentleness towards them. Well, we all know the story. The third time, the third time our Lord meets Peter where Peter's at, and he says, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? Only this time, the Lord uses the word philia, and Peter's now grieved, and he answers, Lord, you know all things. 
And you know I, Philia, you. Peter has the love of brotherhood, but the Lord knew that he could develop into agape love. And indeed, we know he will. But Peter was grieved here. It was because this was the third time he was asked. But I also think that he was thinking back just a few days before when on a crisp night, standing around a fire, just like they were here, he was cursing, denying that he knew Christ. And looking through that fire, he got a glimpse of Christ who turned around and looked at him and the cock crew the final time. And Peter went out and wept bitterly, bawled like a baby. In my mind, that's a form of repentance for Peter. I love Peter. Because I've been there. And for those of you who know my testimony, you know it revolved around two apostles, Luke and Peter. Luke telling the story, and Peter was the character. Today I'm just going to tell a small part of my testimony. I was looking for confirmation for the first part of my testimony, which had, I felt had to do with faith. Just like this ex first experience, I was awakened early in the morning. It was around 3 o'clock. And I was told to write down Luke 22. After trying to resist the spirit, trying to go back to sleep, tossing and turning for probably at least an hour, I said, okay, okay, Lord, I'll get up and write it down. What verse do you want me to write down? I got no answer. I got re nothing. Just write down Luke 22. So I did. I got up and wrote down Luke 22. The next morning I got up and I was reading Luke 22. And I came to the verses that, in my mind, or at least I thought that they appeared twice the size of the other verses. They were bolded. They were highlighted. And the verses had my name in it. And this is what I read. The Lord said, Rick, Rick, behold, Satan hath desired you, that he may sift the children of the kingdom as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your fail, that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Well, that was absolutely the confirmation that I needed. It was also impressed on my heart that, that I, I had other people intercessing for me. My parents, my mom and dad, and also my brother Bruce were intercessing for me on my behalf. I just didn't really realize how far down the drain I'd went. Isn't that what family's all about? Isn't that what Christ did with his disciples when they wandered off the path? He didn't say to them, hey, you losers. Hey, you jerks. You catch anything out there doing what you're not supposed to be doing? No. He didn't talk to them like that. He said, children, have you any meat? He used a term of endearment. He did it with love, agape love, family. What would we do without it? Two families come to my mind when I think about family, our personal family, the ones God put us in, and the ones we were blessed with. I was raised by godly parents. My mom was raised in the church while my dad was a convent, convert. So I was raised in a godly home. My mom and dad were married for over 62 years. That's almost unheard of in, in today's world. But 
I think that that was passed on to Julie and I, and we've been married for over 53 years. And subsequently, the sanctity of our marriage has been passed on to our children, who have been married 28, 26, 21, and 20 years, respectfully. My mom always told me the secret to having a good long marriage was don't ever go to bed arguing, don't ever go to bed fighting. Stay up as long as it takes till you get it over with, till you get it done with. And I was telling that to Julie, and she said that she reminded me that Dad, when she used to, when Julie and I would get in an argument, she'd go over to my mom and dad's house. They sided with her. And Dad used to tell Julie, you know, if you guys are arguing in your house, the devil's sitting on top of the roof laughing because he's getting exactly what he wants. My mom and dad had a wonderful family of five children, me being the oldest. We were a family that played together, ate together, went to church together, and studied together. We were one, and still are, a very close-knit family. My sister told me that one thing she always remembered about our family meals was when I would come in and sit down, and I would squeeze her knee and say, Elizabeth? How was your day today? I was talking to her just the other day, and she said that that was one of her favorite parts of the meal. She clearly remembered exactly where she and I sat and where mom and dad sat because of where we sat. She said that was one of the best parts of the meal. Julie and I had been blessed with four wonderful children, each one unique and each one loved along with their families. And it's the little things that we do in a family that helps us grow and draw closer to each other. My youngest daughter gave me a card. I think I even, yeah, I put it in my Bible. I love this card. She gave me this card for Father's Day and she addressed it to Daddy. My daughter has called me, my youngest daughter has called me Daddy for as long as I can remember. And it's special to me. It's a term of endearment. It's those little things that mean a lot to us, that we can build those relationships on in family. Anyway, I'm very thankful for the family that I was put in, the family that Julie and I have. I'm especially thankful for the intercessory prayers on, my, on the part of my mom and dad and my brother Bruce. My personal family, I would not know what to do without them. I know that each of you could relate stories about your family, and I hope you have time to tell them someday to me. I also wanted to talk about another family. We each have this family, and that's our church family, each of you. What would each of us do without the other? I can only imagine. Since we've been putting on Sunday school classes and, and the Wednesday night prayer service, I've come to know and love each one of the people that attend, just like I know and love each one of you guys. I know their voice. I know some of their mannerisms. I so look forward to the time that we spend together, just like the times that we spend together. Those relationships have become very precious to me. That relationship has grown because you have gone outside of yourselves to share things that the outside world probably will never know about you. When you're not online or here in person, you're missed. When you're hurting, we cry for you. When you're sick, we pray for you. I don't know which one of these cameras is working, but Joe McEver, Lou Zahner, Ralph Damon, we're praying for you as a group. Get better. So yes, I do have strong feelings for all the people in God's church. I told Darlene I was going to talk about her just a bit. She has been so faithful with her text that she sends out for those that have needed prayers. But Monday morning, she also sends out a little, quick little text 
wishing us a great week. And she has some little something that goes along with that. And it's a little cartoon or some kind of a funny thing that's automated. It's great, and it's needed. If you're not on our text, you need to, to give her a call and have her add you to it. Our family needs to stay close. I'm talking about our church family here. The world is getting ugly out there, just like has been prophesied. To So please, Darlene, I don't think she's here. I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see. Darlene, if you're listening to this or if you're here, keep up the good work. In closing, I want to read a song that was put up or put out by the Geither family. And they have several songs in our hymnal. And, I, and for lack of, uh, for the, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read the chorus each time like a song. But I'm just going to read the, the two main verses and, and the chorus one time. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family, and these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. From the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags into riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God, I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. As I said in my opening scripture reading, we were told just one week ago to have forgiveness, to have grace, and to have agape towards one another so that we can unite in this worthy cause of the gospel and take that good news to the world. Yes, we are the family of God, and I truly do love all of you.
Holy be the name of God. Holy be the name of Jesus Christ. Holy be the name of the Holy Spirit. Surely this morning, Lord, we have been blessed. Blessed by the ministry of music, by the Baker family. Blessed by the words of thy servant that we have been reminded of that greatest gift is the gift of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I was reminded this morning of love, of how you built your church and at the pinnacle of the top of your church was the word love and it shared all these upon your church. Father, we know that the greatest love is to be able to lay your life down. And you did this for each one of us and for your church. So I humbly ask this morning for that love to be showered out among your children. I pray this morning that you would be with those ones that have come into your midst upon this sacred and holy ground and pray, Lord, that they would leave knowing that it is never too late to come unto you, to give all unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask. Amen. <laughs> 